Thanks for coming in and welcome to this presentation. In this session, we'll be talking about a fairly mature project that has been under development for many years. We have a new project for Apache Software Foundation called Apache NLP Craft that is currently undergoing incubation at ASF. NLP Craft provides a fresh and unique take on one of the most exciting part of the natural language processing, namely a natural language interface or comprehension to the applications. It is based on unorthodox ideas that are in stark contrast to many existing techniques used in the field. We believe these ideas result in a simpler programming model and much faster development time. This presentation is split in two parts. In the first 20 minutes, I'll talk about what an appeal craft is and isn't, what are some of its unique ideas, how it works at a high level, and how it is different from many existing approaches. In the second part, I'll sort of try to provide a proof around the key claims that I made in the first part of the presentation. The proof is in the pudding, as the saying goes, and I'll do a full live coding demonstration where I will build a fully functional application that would have a natural language interface to it. You'll see every line of code in configuration. Nothing is pre-built or pre-cooked. I'll develop everything from scratch, and you'll be able to see for yourself what it takes to build something like that with NLP Craft, and hopefully I'll be able to do it all in less than 20 minutes. So without further ado, let's dive in. One of the first things that I think we need to clarify is the distinction between the general processing of natural language as an academic discipline and the specific task of providing spoken and written interface using natural language comprehension. Natural language processing, the NLP, is a 50-year-old umbrella term that historically grew out of computing mathematical linguistics. It principally deals with techniques and technologies for the automatic manipulation of a spoken or written natural language. It includes dozens of different applications from speech recognition and speech generation, grammar correction to various forms of statistical analysis for documents and so on. As such, the NLP field consists of a dazzling variety of different technologies, framework libraries, and modeling approaches. Natural language interface, the NLI, on the other hand, is a specific application of NLP that deals squarely with the idea of providing an application interface that is based on comprehension of a natural language. It is often called question and answer systems, chatbots, AI assistants, and so on. So what is so special about natural language interface? As it turns out, the natural language interface has a set of unique advantages that I believe are important to mention here. First of all, when you think about it, natural language interface is the only possible interface that is uniform or homogeneous across any data models, weather languages, or any other proprietary interfaces. In fact, pick any two or more sufficiently different software systems, and you will quickly re realize that often the only common human interface between them would be one based on speech or text communication. Another often overlooked Yet obvious advantage of natural language interface is the fact that, well, everyone already knows it. That is absolutely unique in software engineering, as practically any other human interface has to be learned at some point. But when it comes to language, almost every human being living on this planet can speak and write in it instantly. That's a powerful statement when you think about it. And we already seen these benefits with the consumer applications of Apple, Siri, Amazon Alexa, and so on. And the last point I'd like to make is the fact that for many modern devices like mobile embedded devices and wearables, spoken language interface is often the only practical choice simply due to inherent limitations of those devices. This makes the natural language interface particularly suited for modern and future applications and devices. So with this background information in mind, let's take a closer look at Apache NLP Craft. On this slide, we'll cover the high-level picture, and on the following slides, we'll talk about some of the key differences in its unique capabilities. Apache NLP Craft is a free open-source library for adding domain-specific natural language interfaces to modern applications. You can define your model in the intents using any JVM-based languages like Java, Scala, Groovy, or Kotlin, and your applications can use REST APIs to explore and control the data using the natural language. So let's unpack this definition a bit. First of all, NLP Craft is part of ASF and hence licensed under Apache 2.0 open source license. NLP Craft is laser focused on developing a narrow domain specific natural language interface for a particular application versus attempting to build some sort of a general artificial intelligence capabilities. This is one of the key differentiating characteristics of NLP Craft and we'll talk about it in a separate section. Also, unlike most NLP libraries today that have a strong academic background and sort of a bucket of a leg of pieces flavor with Python roots, NLP Craft is built from the ground up based on a modern Java ecosystem and tailor-made for rapid commercial software development 
where engineering efficiency and ultimate productivity reign supreme. Let's take a closer look at this diagram at the bottom of the slide that depicts some of the main components of NLP Craft runtime architecture. Let's start with the data model. NLP Craft employs model as a code approach where the entire data model is part of the source code. Data model is simply an implementation of a Java interface that can be developed using any JVM programming languages, like aforementioned Java, Scala, Kotlin, or Groovy. Data model defines named entities, various configuration properties, as well as intents to interpret the user input. To make use of a data model, it has to be deployed in a data probe. Data probe is a lightweight container designed to securely deploy and manage user data models. Each probe can deploy and manage multiple models and many probes can connect to the REST server. The main purpose of a data probe is to separate data model hosting from managing REST calls from the client applications. While you would typically have just one REST server, you may have multiple data probes deployed in different geolocations and configured differently. Data probes can be deployed and run anywhere as long as there is any ingress connectivity from REST server and are typically deployed in DMZ or close to your target data sources, whether it's on-premise or in the cloud. Note that data probe uses strong encryption in ingress-only connectivity for communicating with the REST server. And finally, the REST server provides URL endpoints for the end-user applications to securely query data sources using natural language via data models deployed in data probes. Its main purpose is to accept REST over HTTP calls from the end-user applications and route this request to and from requested data props. Unlike a data prop that gets restarted every time the model is changed, for example, during the development, the REST server is sort of a fire and forget component that can be launched typically only once while various data props can continuously reconnect to. It can usually run as a Docker image on-premise or in the cloud. Now let's talk about some of the unique features of NLP Craft. We'll start with a bit of a history. When we were envisioning NLP Craft a few years back, one of the driving motivators behind it was the dissatisfaction with an existing status quo of NLP ecosystem. That NLP ecosystem back then and today can be characterized by a proliferation of mostly half-baked projects addressing esoteric academic research topics focusing on low-level NLP problems while in the same time trying to solve a higher-level task of language comprehension, for example, leaving the users of these frameworks with a large amount of heavy lifting and daunting development tasks. It also didn't help that most of these frameworks and libraries were using Python, which simply isn't suitable for the modern enterprise software development. On the other hand, the commercial offerings like Siri or Alexa or Dialogflow or Cortana were and are extremely closed in proprietary and very limited in their feature set. We should also remember that the industry as a whole was going through a phase of fascination with chatbots that, frankly, ended just as quickly as it started. Yet another problem plaguing this community is a semi-automatic reflexy to shoehorn every problem into the mold of neural networks and cast every solution in the light of statistical linguistics. And while for many applications like sentiment analysis, named entity detection, translation, speech recognition, this probabilistic approach is valid, even if you ignore the massive time sink of preparing the maintaining custom corpus of training data sets. Most of the real-life enterprise natural language interfaces simply cannot work in a probabilistic way. This is something we have learned early on in the life of this project. Let me give you a quick example to illustrate this point. While a typical business user would happily accept the probabilistic result for sentiment analysis, in fact, it doesn't really matter if your, say, Twitter feed is 85 or 87 percent positive at a given time, as long as it's trending in the right direction. The same business user will simply reject the system that, for the question, what is my average sale price for the last quarter, gives the answer with a confidence probability less than 100 percent. Most, if not all, business analytics and operations cannot operate on a probabilistic basis. Just imagine you walking into your local bank and asking for your account balance and hearing back that it is most likely that you have $100, let's say, in your account, but we can't guarantee it. It just does not work like that in real life. So all of these issues and the early teething problem resulted in a hard-to-use, overly complicated, arcane feel to most of NLP frameworks and libraries that seemingly require an inordinate amount of time to develop something tangible and useful. And that was the backdrop behind the ideas that led to NLP crowd development. We decided to build a framework that would focus solely on solving one single problem and solving it in the most effective and productive way. How to build a natural language interface 
modern applications. To accomplish this, we decide to ditch Python and develop NLP Craft in the Java ecosystem. We use a model as a code approach where everything you do in NLP Craft is part of your source code that you can simply check into Git, similar to the modern day configuration as a code idea. The main APIs of NLP Craft consist of just a few dozen interfaces that you can learn in less than an hour. We use annotations to bind the user intents to the callback in an idiomatic Java way. Most of the examples that are shipped with NLP Craft are less than 100 lines of code, while delivering a, the fully working applications. NLP Craft comes with advanced command line management utility supporting interactive REPL mode. This utility automates and simplifies many routine tasks such as server and the data prop lifecycle management, auto validation of the model, REST API access, project stop generation, and as well as running various built in tools. NLP Craft hides most of the lower level NLP processing and complexity from the user and provides its own set of normalized named entity recognizers while supporting a long list of third party providers as well. NLP Craft exposes universal and simple REST API for a seamless integration with any type of client application. NLP Craft also provides an advanced out of the box support for maintaining and managing conversational context that is fully automatic and integrated with the built in intent matching. NLP Craft STM stands for short term memory is a real breakthrough implementation for this idea. Usually a daunting problem that's typically just left to the user to solve on his own. And finally, a fully deterministic NLP craft intent matching is its calling card and a singular most important standout feature. Something that makes it so much more powerful yet simpler to use than any other framework that came before it. So let's take a closer look at NLP craft intent matching. In general, the goal of natural language comprehension is to take a user input, spoken or written, and somehow match it to the user defined code that will execute for that input, returning the result, which will be sent back as a response for the original user input. That mechanism that defines this matching is called an intent. An intent refers to the goal that an user had in mind when speaking or typing the input utterance. The intent has two parts, a declarative part or a template written in intent definition language, which we'll look at below, that describes a particular form or type of the input utterance. Intent is also bound to a callback method, a second part, that will be executed where that intent, namely its template, is detected as the best match for a given user input. Typical data model will have multiple intents defined for each form of the expected user input that model wants to react to. Before we talk about details of intent matching, it is important to mention the idea of a named entity that I already referred to multiple times before. I like the classic computational linguistics that deals with the basic grammar point of speech forms like noun, verb, and adjective. NLP graph, just like the most modern NLP systems, deals with a higher level abstraction called named or semantic entity. A named entity is typically one or more individual words that have a consistent semantic meaning and commonly denote a real-world object, such as a person, location, number, date and time, organization, product, etc. Such object can be abstract or have a physical existence. We call named entity normalized if it contains additional metadata. For example, imagine having the two words, bird and lizard, both are nouns and indistinguishable from a point of view of classic linguistics. But if we have a special named entity recognizer, we could detect that the first word is a named entity animal with the metadata kind of bird. And the second word is also the same named entity animal, but metadata kind would have value reptile, giving us a clear distinction between two words and much more information to work with. One of the unique capabilities of NLP Graph is ability to compose new named entities from the existing ones. Named Entity Recognizer is typically a very complex component to develop. NLP Craft ability to simply Lego construct the new ones from the existing building blocks is industry first. Now, the reason we talked about named entities is because NLP Craft automatically parses the user input utterance into a set of named entity sequences that all together act as an input to the intent matching algorithm. As I mentioned before, intents are written in IDL. NLP Craft's Intent Definition Language. IDL is industry first declarative language for defining user intents. While IDL is very rich language, your intents can be as simple or as complex as your matching logic requires. Although the in-depth discussion about IDL is out of scope for this presentation, here are some of the key capabilities of IDL. 
IDL is a declarative flag. You can attach it directly to the callback method via Java annotation, or you can store IDL declarations in separate files in reference them. IDL's intent definition consists of one or more terms, which are sometimes called slots. Term is a building block for intent. Intent must have at least one term. Term has an optional ID, a declarative token predicate, and optional quantifiers defining how many times a term must appear to match. Terms support optional conversation context. For the conversational term, the system will search for a match using tokens from the current request as well as tokens from the conversational STM, short-term memory. The match term represents one or more tokens, sequential or not, that were detected in a user input. As mentioned, the intent has at least a term, always at least one, that all have to be matched in the user input for the entire intent to match. IDL supports both ordered and unordered intents, which indicates whether or not the order of the terms in the intent is important. IDL also supports matching on dialogue flow. The dialogue flow is a history of previously matched intents within the same session to match on. If provided, the intent will first match on the history of previously matched intents before processing its terms. IDL also provides many other capabilities, parameterized fragments to extract reusable terms, user-defined variables to shorten the code and promote reusability, and over 150 functions to use in token predicates, as well as full support for metaprogramming. All in all, NLP Craft provides powerful and feature-rich technology for defining sophisticated intents and intent matching logic. Hopefully, by this point in our presentation, you have the basic understanding of what NLP Craft is and what it can do. In the next 20 minutes, uh, we'll develop a prototype for the natural language powered light switch for your home as our example. We'll concentrate on the language comprehension part of this project, and I'll leave the actual hardware integration with HomeKit or Arduino controllers outside the scope. As I mentioned at the beginning, we'll do this exercise completely from scratch, starting with downloading NLP Craft. To download, go to nlpcraft.apache.org and click on the download link. For this example, we've downloaded the official Apache release that contains source code. Once downloaded, first unzip it. Once unzipped, we need to run the classic Maven build. If you do it for the first time, the build can take uh, just a few minutes. But once it's complete, we can start, go ahead and start building our light switch example. To manage our runtime components, the REST server and the data prop, we use a very handy NLP craft command line utility that I mentioned before. The script is located in the bean subfolder. So let's start the NLP craft script. First, we're going to create a new project step using the gen project command. You can always look at the help for the commands. And you can basically view all the documentation for all the different parameters of this command. Let's go ahead and create a project step, which is basically um, will create us a directory structure for the project, which we can import into the idea. So the first, uh, the base name of the project will be a light switch. And uh, the build tool by default is Maven, which we're going to use the base name where we depict. Uh, we're going to use Scala as a language. And um, I think the package name is what we need to basically define. And uh, we can call it a demo. And so this command basically generated this uh, structure for us, which with all necessary components, all we have to do now is to basically import this project into the some choice of our ID, which we'll use IntelliJ ID in this case. Let's go ahead and start the IntelliJ ID and open our project or import our project. It may take a few minutes to load all the Maven dependencies the first time and scan and do everything what IntelliJ does. But fundamentally, we basically just open the same project structure that we've seen in our command line utility. So let's quickly take a look what we've got. Now, this is the project stop. Uh, it has essentially the naming we give it to. It also has some example source code, example model, example configuration file, which we're going to basically be changing to add our functionality. So the main source code is the light switch. For simplicity, I'm going to remove all the comments from here, make the code just a little bit more simpler for us to understand and see on the screen. Uh, but basically, this class light switch, it extends um, NC model file adapter, which essentially just loads the most of the model configuration properties from this file, light switch 
YAML, which we'll just take a look at in a second. And essentially has one minute call on match. And this is the callback for our intent. And intent is this intent ID. It's an ID of intent that is defined in this model. We'll, we'll look at it in a sec again. And um, it has the basic functionality, just returning the text with the word that's been found in the, in, uh, in the input text. So if we look at the light switch YAML that located in the resources subfolder, this is basically plain vanilla NLP graph model. Most of this data over here is default. It's here just for configuration. Uh, we could remove it. It's going to be all basically sensible defaults. What's interesting to us is essentially is this element, essentially uh, the elements that we have. We only have one element. Uh, it has the idea of element ID. Uh, and it basically refers to a macro, which is defined here. But what it says basically that the element ID is defined by synonyms. And the synonym is basically consists of a word sum, optional word, this is what indicates the optionality and either word one or word two. So if we look over here, we have a array of samples that actually is very useful because this is exactly the same array. Think about it as kind of an in, in, uh, in place corpus for testing. This is exactly the same array that's going to be used by a built in test framework to essentially validate our model. These are the type of inputs that should be matched into this intent and therefore this callback should be called. With that being said, we actually can uh, build this example and uh, we'll take it just a few seconds, hopefully. And yes, we have this target folder where the compiled classes are. We can go back to our NLP craft uh, command line and we actually, we can run the test on this model. It's not going to do anything interesting, but at least we're going to test the entire, you know, testing tool chain. So let's go back to our command line. And first we need to start the server. Very simply, start server command. Now, remember, this start the NLP craft server is sort of a fire and forget component. We only need to start it once. As a matter of fact, if you routinely work with NLP craft, you can just set it up as the operating system process that starts with the operating system. It takes about 20 seconds on this uh, laptop to start. Once it's started, we can see over here that the server is on in a prompt line, and we see a lot of configuration information that has been printed out for us. Now we can use a command called a test model. And a test model essentially is a very convenient command. It will automatically start an embedded probe, essentially kind of temporary probe, load the model, we indicate which one we want in the model. I mean the test, it's going to be our demo.lightswitch model. And it will run essentially automatic validation for this model. Again, by submitting each of these sentences to the model and making sure that exactly that callback is called essentially that this intent is matched for that sentence. So let's go back and give it a shot. First, we need to specify the class path for it. And uh, it's very convenient. Uh, we can use all kinds of the outer completion here. And then we have to basically indicate uh, which model. By the way, you can look how convenient it is. You don't have to be typing anything. In LP craft command line is very smart by picking up all the class, analyzing the class path and jar files, extracting the model names and give you these, you know, outer completions. And once we start it, it basically starts the exactly the same normal data prop and it runs all of these examples. And you can see results over here in this table. So we got, we run the four test, exactly the same as the amount of our, the sample strings we have, all of them passed. They all basically got matched in this intent. There's a bit of execution time over here. Now let's go back and start working on our model. What I usually like to do is to start with intent samples as kind of the base. So we're going to start working on this particular examples. And let's just come up with some sentences and in the, in the inputs that we would like to parse. For example, we can say, uh, turn the lights on in the entire house. Another one we can say, um, get the lights on at all the lights. Please, you can also say um, the illumination in the garage. Please, no lights. Could you please off the lights in the bedroom? So that should be enough. Now, this is actually, again, give us a very good base. We can, you know, work on off of this for testing and for coming up with our model. And if we take a look at the sentences, we probably can see that there are essentially three types of semantic elements we're dealing here. The first is location, right? It's an entire house, it's a garage, it's a bedroom, kitchen, whatever else. And then there's the two types of actions. 
uh, we, we can see from this example, there is action to turn on the lights and to turn off the lights. And this is something we can actually now go back to the model and encode those entities and actually use them in our intent to kind of match these sentences. So with these observations in mind, let's open up our model and start working on it. First, we're going to work on the elements. And we're going to create three elements for those three elements we just discussed. One for location and two for on and off action. We're going to use macros for uh, reusable synonyms. And for the action, we're going to use these basic verbs. And I think we can add the word switch to it. We're also going to create a macro for the lights. And it should be a light, can be it, can be a lamp, can be lamp light, can be illumination. We also should add an optional word all. And now we can define our own and off actions. So we don't really care about descriptions right now. Let's just simplify this a bit. Let's work on the on action. So we can use our newly minted macros and have something like this. We can also define it just very much similarly like this. For the off action, it's a little bit more complicated, but just slightly. Uh, what we can do is actually uh, use again our macros and have off or out in the end. You can also have this in here. We also need to uh, probably expand this a little bit because we can say kill, shot. What else can we say? We can stop, you know, we can say eliminate here. And we also can say no light. Now, for the location, it's going to be a little bit interesting. So we can start with just the basic list of locations in the house. Things like kitchen, bedroom, uh, garage, playroom, office, laundry. What else can we say? That's good enough for now. We should also basically mention that it can be um, entire, full, or whole house. So probably let's create another marker and call it, let's fix this marker for now, and call it um, entire. Make it optional. And uh, what we can do here is to say it's going to be one entire, full, total, whole, or, or nothing. Just optional. Let's use it here. What else can we say? Well, obviously, we can say uh, the same entire, but use it with a different set of words like house, home, building. And we can say the first floor and let's keep it simple second floor. So that should give us a, a good set of locations we can work with. By the way, uh, we can actually add upstairs and downstairs here as well. I think it makes sense. We can add upstairs, downstairs, make it option. That should give us a, a good set of locations. Now, the last thing we need to do is to just change our intent to use this. And then we'll have two terms, one term for the action and uh, zero or more terms for locations. So we can have one action on and off and multiple uh, potential locations. One thing we actually have to do is to add, is to group the actions into the single group. So we could use that. So over here, we can say the first term is going to be, have the name act. In the second term, we have name location, zero or more. This term would have basically a simple function called has token groups. Essentially, we're saying that any token that has, that belongs to group act. And here, we're basically going to say token ID should be equal to last location and that should be it for our data model now that we have our model ready we can go back and work on our callback in our scala application so this is our callback remember that in our model we have the intent with the two terms one term for the action and another call a term for a location so we're going to basically grab those terms and as our parameters to a call to our callback method and we're going to use annotation here we can supply the first notation for the action, and we're going to call this action token, and we're going to use a notation to grab location. And now for location, we're going to have multiple tokens because we support multiple locations based on our intent, and um, we're going to have a list of tokens. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, in this example, we're going to concentrate just on a natural language comprehension part. We're not going to deal with a hardware integration through HomeKit or Arduino controllers. So here, we're just going to return a string back, indicating the status of a light on and off, and indicate in which location these lights were turned on or turned off. So the first thing we're going to do is to essentially get the status string, and that's going to be pretty simple. We're just going to check uh, the ID of of the action token and they turn either on or off. 
The second variable we're going to use is locations. And that's going to be a list of locations. We're going to grab it from, from the list of tokens. Now, it's very important that we can check that if the list of location tokens is empty, then we basically just assume its entire house. And that's our logic. Otherwise, we essentially just take the list of locations and we extract the original text from it. And we essentially make the strings out it with the time of separation. What we're gonna do here is that we're just gonna return the text. Uh, we're gonna say that lights are either on and off, depending on the status. And we're gonna say in, and again, we're gonna use our locations. And we're gonna just format them a little bit. And final dot. That's all there is to it. So let's compile this and run our examples in in our command line tool. We're gonna use, actually, we already run the uh, test in the model. We can essentially just Call the retest the model, run the auto validation, auto testing with exactly the same parameters as the last time. So let's analyze our output. First of all, we now got a very similar output like the last time, but now with actual uh, sentences that we had in our sample array. All of them passed, meaning that all of the sentences actually got matched to this callback. Now let's check actually if we get a, a correct answer for that. So the very last request, for example, was, would you please switch off the lights in the bedroom? So if we scroll all the way after this extensive output, we can see the results here that the lights are off in the bedroom. This is the result, the text result that was sent back to the rest caller. And we can check all other results here, for example, for Please, no lights. We're assuming in this entire house. So our response should be lights are off in the entire house. So things appear to work. Now we can play with this a little bit more. Uh, one thing we didn't test, we didn't test in multiple locations. So we can go ahead and uh, just attach the different annotation so we don't confuse things. And let's modify this example and say we're going to turn the lights um, in the kitchen, bedroom, and closet. I'm going to comment out this one and let's test this one. So first we build. Go back here and retest the model. And the result is okay. And we can see here that the lights are on in the kitchen, bedroom, and closet. So that actually works very nicely. The last interesting thing we can do is we can actually try something different that we don't have in the model. For example, we can say something like this. Could you please switch off the lights in storage room? And we don't have a storage room in our model. So let's see how this is going to react. I'm going to comment out the, the other ones so we don't get too much output. So build it first. Go back here and test the model. Notice how convenient it is to actually do all this testing with the NLP Craft command line utility. So apparently it worked, uh, but let's see the results. So results are actually incorrect because the best good size lights are off in the entire house. So if we look here a little bit more closely in um, information, the storage room were essentially a free word, meaning that a system didn't know anything about the storage room and it assumed that just the words, those not a stop words, those are meaningful words, but you know we don't we don't have any named entities for it, uh, so we can go ahead and fix that. For example, uh, we can go back to our light switch model. We can basically add storage, and essentially then add a word room optional to the end of the location, so we can have all kinds of rooms. Once again, build it and retest the model, and now let's take a look. The results are positive again, but now the lights are off in a storage room, in exactly the location that we've indicated in our model, so right here. Okay, let's slow down a bit and recap what we have accomplished in the last 15 minutes. We began with an idea of a smart home light switch that will be controlled by the natural language commands. We started from scratch and were able to complete a working prototype in about 15 minutes, from start to finish, as far as converting natural language into programming logic. Yes, it will take you another couple of hours to add a HomeKit integration, but it's a remarkable result all around. In less time than it takes to download and configure Python in all its necessary packages, you can build from scratch a fully functional application that can understand your natural language commands. Remarkable indeed. This level of productivity and automation is the guiding principle of an LP craft project, and in my opinion, it is the best framework to convert a natural language into actions. Thank you for your time. I hope I was able to tell the story behind Apache NLP Craft and you have learned something new and useful today. If you want to learn more, NLP Craft website is the best source and it's full of documentation and examples. If you're interested in joining the project, you're welcome to NLP Craft community. Thank you again.